uh, to our uh, uh, last uh, session in this uh, online course on vaccines. Um, really a warm welcome to all of you to have joined us and a special welcome to Prof. Charles Wasongi that is joining us to facilitate this session where we're going to be covering vaccine procurement mechanisms. Um, so uh, uh, just by way of introduction, Charles has, is very involved with uh, vaccine advisory groups. He's involved with the South, with the South African National um, Vaccine Advisory Group, on, uh, especially linked to vaccine hesitancy. He also does some work with the WHO Afro Advisory Group on vaccines. Um, and specifically, his work has been around uh, behavioral and social drivers associated with uh, the uptake of, of COVID vaccines. So we're really delighted to have you with us, Charles. Uh, just a reminder in terms of housekeeping, if everyone can please keep their mics on mute um, and videos off while Charles is presenting, you are more than welcome to pose comments and questions in the chat as he progresses with his presentation. And following the presentation, we will have a round of questions and answers. So for now, I hand over to Charles. Thank you so much, Tarin, and thank you for inviting me. So I would put my video off and then put it back again when we start uh, the questions while I'm presenting. <clears throat> so thank you so much for inviting me to talk about uh, COVID-19 vaccine procurement uh, mechanisms. So I'm going to drill a lot on COVAX, but also talk about the supply agreements that the African Union has made. So the, the plan of the presentation is going to, is as shown on the, this slide. So we're going to first start by looking at the COVID-19 cases and deaths in Africa as an introduction. Then look at the scramble for COVID-19 vaccines uh, worldwide, then uh, talk about COVAX and the goal of COVAX, then look at supply, uh, COVID-19 vaccine supply agreements in, in terms of COVAX, the African Union, but see who else has also made uh, supply agreements with manufacturers. And since uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization is playing a key role in uh, COVAX, we, they have had a lot of experience with access to vaccines more generally over the last 20 years. Just look at what their business model is and how they go about it. And, and that might also give insight into how uh, COVAX is uh, being managed. And then we'll also look at the COVID-19 vaccine rollout worldwide. And with some emphasis on COVAX, the rollout through COVAX, and then also look at the rollout in Africa and then in, as a conclusion, I'll just uh, tell a story of what happened during uh, HIV uh, when in, in the 1990s with access to antiretroviral drugs and just see why we need to ensure that such a thing doesn't happen uh, this time around. So as of last week, WHO estimated that there were about, there had been uh, 4,225,757 uh, cases of COVID confirmed on the African continent. These are confirmed cases, and there might be a lot out there that has not been confirmed. And 38% uh, of these are from are in uh, from South Africa. Then we have about 12.1% uh, from Morocco, 6% uh, from Tunisia, 4.7% uh, from Egypt, and 4.3% from <clears throat> Ethiopia. Out of this, the more than 4 million cases, about 108,000 uh, have died, and about half of these are from South Africa, then 10.5% from Egypt, then 8.1% from Morocco, 7.8% from Tunisia, and 2.8% from Algeria. Of the four million, more than 4 million cases, the 108,000 uh, deaths represent 2.7% which is what is usually referred to as the case fatality rate. That is the number of people who die as a proportion of those who were uh, infected. And of course, the, uh, globally, it, the situation is much worse. 
And that is why there is a, a scramble for COVID-19 vaccines. And here, uh, I, I like, this is a, a, a graph from, or a, a photo from a, a newspaper article that was published in June, 2020, really showing what a scramble, even at that time was already for COVID-19 vaccines, even before they became uh, available. And at the moment, we are really witnessing panic buying of uh, vaccines by high income countries, and they are mopping up supply and squeezing out lower income countries. Rather than an emphasis on global access, we are seeing an accelerating trend towards vaccine nationalism. And just to liken to what happened in uh, about um, 11 years ago when we had the H1N1 pandemic. So in 2009, when the world was threatened by the H1N1 influenza pandemic, high income countries use their financial cloud to commandeer the entire global vaccine supply. And vaccines were not provided to middle income and low income countries until demand in high income countries was fully satisfied. And actually when the vaccines were arriving in uh, um, uh, most middle income countries and low income countries, the, pande uh, the pandemic had actually bent itself out. So this could actually be a, a, a postscript to COVID-19 if adequate steps are not taken now. And that is why there is a need for initiatives such as COVAX and also uh, the vaccine procurement through uh, groups like the African uh, Union. So uh, COVAX is the vaccine's pillar of what is called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And COVAX plans to provide, as shown on this slide, uh, doses for at least 20% of uh, the country's population for countries that are participating through the COVAX. And COVAX is led by, is co-led by the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, known as GAVI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation called CEPI and the World Health Organization. So the idea when uh, COVAX came up was that when they would provide this 20, at least 20% uh, vaccine at least 20 percent provide vaccines to vaccinate at least 20 percent of the each country's population that eventually could end the acute phase of the pandemic and start to rebuild uh, economies. So as of uh, today, the uh, data that uh, publicly available data on the, from uh, UNICEF shows that the, and these are the main, there have been uh, supply agreements between countries, between groups and vaccine manufacturers. And these are the key ones, the top ones. So the, the single entity that has uh, secured through uh, supply agreements, the highest number of vaccines is the COVAX. And they have supply agreements for 3.56 uh, billion doses. And the next is the United States of America, which has secured uh, supply agreements for 3.46 uh, billion doses. Then the European Commission with uh, 2.729 uh, billion doses. And the African Union then comes in uh, fourth with 970 million doses that have been secured. And if you look on the right there, it shows where the vaccines, these vaccines are coming from, the vaccine developers. And you will see the, for the blue are the, the low, on, the, on the graph, the one, the, uh, the one at the bottom there, is, those are uh, doses from AstraZeneca, then the Beijing Institute of Biological Products, and those colors just go, uh, go there and you see some institutions and countries have secured more of one vaccine uh, than the other. And some of the vaccines are really the ones that are still in uh, development, we don't yet know whether they will be, uh, or they will prove, uh, they will be proven to be effective. And that is actually how the some of these supply agreements they were actually even when the trials were still starting in the middle of last year of of last year. So, <clears throat> the African Union has secured uh, this 970 uh, million doses, and which will be uh, distributed, but will. Let's look at that again, those ones that they have uh, secured uh, the supply agreement. So most of that, uh, about half of those doses are from AstraZeneca. Then there is the, the Gamalaya Research Institute from uh, Russia. They've secured about 300 million doses 
from them. Then there's the Johnson and Johnson, the Johnson, which is about uh, uh, I think about 100 million doses they have secured from uh, Johnson and Johnson. And then the Pfizer BioNTech is about 40 million doses that the African Union has secured. But most of these are not yet being delivered. The delivery is still uh, pending. So and the COVAX on which we are going to draw a bit more today. You saw uh, the 3.56 billion doses that COVAX has secured. So about uh, uh, 600 million doses are from AstraZeneca. Then there are about uh, half a billion doses are still from vaccines that are still in development, the COVAX R&D portfolio, the ones that they have advanced money to this while the vaccines are still being tested in case they become positive, they, they get, uh, they are proven to be effective and safe and they are authorized, then they would buy this, but if they are not proven to be effective, obviously they won't, uh, they won't buy them. Then there are also, they have made supply agreements with Johnson, Johnson and Johnson, and now we know that that vaccine has now been proven to be safe and effective. And the Food and Drug Administration in the, U, uh, in the US and also the European Medicine Agency, they have uh, uh, or, to, uh, or given an emergency use authorization for that vaccine so they can now procure, but other agencies have not. The Novavax uh, vaccine, the, uh, I think they're, they're getting about uh, up to about a billion doses for, or more from for Novavax. That one has also been proven to be, the trials have uh, all complete, uh, completed and there have been press releases showing uh, what the effectiveness have, uh, was and the safety, but uh, the, uh, it has not yet been, it has not yet received emergency use authorization. So until that happens, they will not get these ones. And then of course, the one from Pfizer and BioNTech, and then the Sanofi and GSK one, which are these ones that are still in development. So the COVAX business model has been used by Gavi for other vaccines. So I would like us to spend uh, some minutes looking at just trying to understand what Gavi has been doing for other vaccines in order to see what they will be doing also for, uh, uh, for COVAX vaccine. So the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, the mission of this uh, uh, agency is to save children's lives and protect people's health by increasing equitable use of vaccines in lower income countries. And we know that approximately one in five of all deaths among children can be prevented by uh, vaccines. And the, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization is a partnership and it brings together the main actors in the global immunization around a joint mission. And these actors and this institution has been uh, in existence since 2000, so for 21 years uh, and, and now. And so the, the is made up of the partnership with vaccine manufacturers, civil society organizations, implementing con uh, country governments, which are lower income uh, countries, the World Health Organization, UNICEF. The initial funding for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization came from the Bill and Menina Guest Foundation. So they remain a key partner there, the World Bank, donor country governments, South African uh, government actually uh, uh, provides for funding. They also support the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization to get vaccines for lower income countries and there are also private sector uh, partners involved. And I just want to il illustrate uh, why uh, this Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization was launched and how it operates just for us to see the similarity between that and the COVAX facility that is ongoing. So Gavi was created to redress a serious inequality. <clears throat> Life-saving vaccines that were widely available in rich uh, countries did not reach children in low-income countries. And one example that is shown here is of uh, redressing the balance that relates to vaccines against the hemophilus uh, influenza type B, uh, which is uh, which used to cause is a bacterium that used to cause uh, one of the main causes of pneumonia and meningitis worldwide in children. So this disease is commonly called hip. So for hemophilus influenza type B, and that's what you see on this slide, percentage of countries with national HIV uh, vaccines. So in 2000, when uh, Gavi started supporting HIV vaccines, just 3% of all low-income countries had introduced the vaccine in, nationally uh, in, in their programs. 
while 72% of high income countries had introduced that. But by 2014, 14 years into the existence of Gavi, thanks to Gavi, actually all low income countries had introduced this vaccine in their national immunization programs and this put them on par with high uh, income countries. So because of the support from Gavi. And I just want to show, I talked already about the hip vaccine, just show also some vaccines and how Gavi was able to uh, ensure that rich uh, countries and low income countries have access to these vaccines at the same time. And then we can just see how, why they are building on this model for COVID-19 vaccine. We take the hepatitis B uh, vaccine. When Gavi was formed, 86% uh, of all high income countries had a vaccine in their program, but only 6% of uh, low income countries had the vaccine in the program. But uh, about 2017, 17 years into the existence of the Gavi, 91% of high income countries saw an increase of uh, about five percentage points from 86% uh, had introduced the uh, vaccine while all low-income countries had introduced the vaccine. So low-income countries actually had done better than high-income countries because of the support from uh, Gavi. And I've already talked about HIP, where there were 72% of high-income countries and only 3% of low-income countries in 2000. And by 2017, all uh, low-income countries as well as all high-income countries had introduced. So because of uh, Gavi support, the low-income countries were on par with the high-income uh, countries. And also looking at the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which was the, uh, the next uh, the major cause of uh, pneumonia, and especially pneumonia, but also meningitis uh, in, 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 ch in children, when these vaccines became available around 2008, and in that year, 51% of half of all high-income countries introduced it, but no low-income country had introduced. But by within uh, 11 years, uh, the, the, the high-income countries had increased to about 88%, and low-income countries were already abounded. But about now, the all uh, low-income countries, uh, as of 2021, 20, uh, have already introduced. So they are now doing better than uh, high-income countries because of support from uh, Gavi. So how does the Gavi model uh, work? So through uh, a unique business model, Gavi pulls demand from the world's poorest countries for vaccines and other immunization products. Then by pulling all this demand, they secure long-term predictable funding through donor contributions and country co-financing of vaccines. And they use them to, this accelerates access to life-saving vaccines through routine immunization and campaigns like I've uh, shown in the previous slide, looking at the hepatitis B vaccines, the hip vaccine and the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So when they procure this, they are able to give a clear signal when they pull uh, this demand, a clear signal to manufacturers of a viable market for vaccines and other immunization products in low income countries. And by so doing, they provide visibility of demand. And this means that they are better, better able to uh, provide sufficient supply at a more affordable rate because they can procure large quantities. The, the Gavi also finds innovative solutions to strengthen health systems and ensure vaccines reach uh, people everywhere. And Gavi supports countries transition uh, out of uh, Gavi support as their national income grows, as they are better able to take over their own immunization program. So usually for the, the vaccines in general, the countries that are supported by Gavi are countries whose uh, gross national income per capita is about $1,580. And when they are from that or below, then they, uh, uh, they can get support from Gavi. But when their uh, economies become stronger and the, the GNI, the gross uh, national income per capita increases and goes above that, then they, uh, they then graduate out of Gavi. And as they graduate, then Gavi supports them to ensure that they still uh, receive funding. And I will show a slide, uh, another slide that shows how this happens. So what Gavi does is they have a, a three 
front uh, approach to ensuring long-term sustainability of immunization program, growing with growing uh, contributions from donors, in, uh, increasing amounts of country uh, co-financing, and a gradual reduction in uh, prices, it leads to a gradual reduction in prices. And I just want to show on this slide before, as we finish with uh, what Gavi has been doing for all the other vaccines, just this slide shows the evolution of the portfolio of Gavi supported vaccines. I had indicated that Gavi started in 2000. By 2001, they were supporting uh, countries, uh, countries with a GNI of less than 1,580 with yellow fever vaccine. These are countries endemic for yellow fever, hepatitis B vaccine. And the pentavalent vaccine is the one where, uh, that contains both diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis vaccines, but also hepatitis B and the hip vaccine that I talked about. While they were supporting some countries who have the, the, this vaccine that contains uh, five vaccines in one, there were still some countries that were using the hepatitis B vaccine as a, a single vaccine. And by 2002, they were already supporting the hip vaccine that I talked about. So by 2007, they were supporting countries to introduce a second dose of the measles vaccine, and then also another vaccine called the rotavirus vaccine for diarrhea, and then uh, meningitis vaccine, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and then in the meningitis belt in, uh, in Africa, which is at the, at the, at the, around, along the, uh, just below the Sahara, along the, the Sahara, they were supporting also the meningitis A vaccines to, against uh, meningitis epidemics. And these are the other vaccines that they have supported, like the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer, measles, rubella vaccine, oral cholera vaccine, the inactivated polio vaccines for countries that are living from using oral polio vaccines to injectable polio vaccines. And then in some countries, especially in Southeast Asia, Japan, encephalitis, and eventually they also supported Ebola vaccines, typhoid vaccines. And overall by 2017, they have supported more than 380 introductions and campaigns uh, around uh, the world. <clears throat> so using this kind of uh, model that Gavi uses for, if we look at, Gavi has helped to dramatically reduce vaccine prices for the poor, poorest countries. And remember, I'm still talking about all the other vaccines, not yet uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So for the 12 vaccines recommended by the World Health Organization for children in all countries, Gavi pays just $35. But if you compare for the same vaccines in the US, uh, the US government pays more than $1,100 uh, for these vaccines. So these price reductions are thanks to increased competition, improved predictability of demand, and proactive market shaping because Gavi can pull all this uh, demand from low income countries and they can then negotiate with pharmaceutical companies as well. For the next 20 years, I'm going to be buying this vaccine, so reduce the price uh, because we, we know that this is going to happen. So they're able to do that. And what they have done, just to uh, quickly show uh, here is, this graph shows the evolution of the proportion of children who have received the, 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 the vaccines against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And this is often used as an indicator of the basic immunization coverage for children. So after the successful, uh, successful efforts in the 1980s led by the United Nations Children Fund and the World Health Organization in building immunization program, there was some stagnation as you see here in the, 90, in the 1990s. So there was rapid increase in 1980s. Then because resources were reduced in the 1990s, this was uh, reduced. But when Gavi was formed in 2000, there was, with support from Gavi, they were able to, uh, low income countries were again able to increase their, um, their, their coverage, the number of children they cover. And by 2016, 16 years into the existence of uh, Gavi, uh, low income countries had increased their coverage by 21 percentage points, just uh, six uh, percentage points below. Uh, the, for the, uh, the global average or 16 percentage points below the high income countries. But this coverage has remained, has stagnated for the last five years. We then show that there is still, Gavi's work is not yet finished. There's still a lot of effort to ensure that these vaccines, uh, countries continue to take them. And I just want to, the, the next, just to show how the financing of Gavi uh, works, just to see how, what they might do for the COVID-19 vaccines is, 
when from the onset of Gavi support, all countries con uh, contribute a portion of the cost of vaccines that Gavi supports. And I am still talking here about vaccines in general before going into the COVID-19 vaccine. So in the initial self-financing phase, countries contribute uh, are set at a contribution are set as 20 cents uh, per dose, US dollars, sufficient to build ownership, but not high enough to deter them from introducing vaccines. So when a country moves to a preparatory transition phase, co-financing payments increase by 15% a year. As the national economy uh, grows and the country surpasses Gavi's eligibility threshold, which I said was 1,580 uh, for GNI uh, per capita, it enters the accelerated uh, the transition phase. And in this, uh, in this five year period, co-financing gradually rises to 100% of Gavi costs. And then eventually, then once their economies now, they are, uh, they are high now, where they are, uh, it goes beyond uh, GNI of 1,580, then they become uh, self-financing. But when they are self-financing, Gavi still provides them with, they still buy the vaccines through Gavi for about five years, because we, if, when they go alone into the market, actually these vaccines can be quite expensive. They also have to hold their hand as they go. So, the, so one of the funding for Gavi then comes from countries co-financing. But how, where does the other money come from? And this is wh what is and one of these is what is used now for uh, COVAX. In addition to direct contributions, donors can fund Gavi through innovative fi uh, finance mechanisms, and one of them, the International Finance Facility for Immunization. So, by leveraging long-term donor pledges to issue and, self, uh, and sell uh, vaccine bonds. The International Finance Facility for Immunization helps countries accelerate investments in immunization. And the, the, through this, uh, Gavi has raised more than 6 billion uh, US dollars in the bond market. Then there is the pneumococcal advanced market commitment. And through this, the pneumococcal advanced market commitment uses donor commitments to incentivize production of pneumococcal vaccines for use in low income countries. So this is where the uh, Gavi, when they, uh, they get the funds, even when the vaccines are still in development, like we're seeing now for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, they can then negotiate with the, with the, with the manufacturer. So well, when these vaccines become ready and they are approved, I have a market, I'm going to be able to buy this amount. So I can commit that when the, in, within the next five years, when your trials are done and these vaccines are approved, this is the amount I will buy. And they can then use that to negotiate how much amount they, they would be able to, to pay for that. And remember, this, this advanced market commitment is a commitment. You say, well, if your vaccines are proven to be effective and they are uh, approved by regulatory authorities, this is the amount I would buy and then they can fix, uh, but they have, they, the money is not yet given until the vaccines are proven to be effective and safe and they are approved. And this is one of the, how they, uh, this is one of the ways they're using for COVID-19 vaccines to the advanced market commitment. But there is another aspect, which is advanced purchase commitment. And they have used this for Ebola vaccines where they actually buy these vaccines in advance and they buy more than 300 million doses of Ebola vaccines that are available for emergency use. Like we are seeing now some, uh, uh, some of the countries that have uh, Ebola outbreaks. And they also have what they call the Gavi matching fund, which matches private sector contributions in cash or in kind. This has helped Gavi secure significant financial and operational support from several uh, leading companies. So for this, uh, the, 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 the last five to 10 minutes, we've been talking about Gavi because we want to see what they are uh, with the model that is being used now for uh, by COVAX. And one of the things that they're using is this advanced market commitment where they commit that they're going to buy uh, this number of doses from companies when they become available. And of course, this commitment is done while the trials are still going on. And it's only when they, are, they, they have been concluded, they are found to be safe and effective and they are authorized by regulatory authorities, then they will be able to buy this. And that is a advanced market commitment that is also being used for COVID-19 vaccines. So this experience of Gavi then is being used, is, uh, has come in handy for COVID-19 vaccines. And let, let's see now 
what is happening now in terms of uh, rule out and also where uh, COVAX is. So uh, as of, I think now we are about 101 days since the first country started vaccinating. The first country that started vaccinating using uh, approved uh, vaccines was the UK and they started on the 8th of December uh, 2020. So it's now about, I think about 101 days now since they started. So this uh, data presented on this slide are from last Friday. So as of last Friday, which was 90 days since the first uh, country started vaccinating, and it was also 75 days since all EU countries received vaccines, and 11 days since the first use of uh, COVAX-19 uh, vaccines, 335 million vaccine doses had been administered. And actually, the first uh, country to the first two countries to administer vaccines received from COVAX were in Africa. These were Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, and they started vaccinating on the 1st of March. So it is now 18 days ago that the COVAX vaccines have started going into people's arms. So as of last Friday, 335 million dose, vaccine doses had been administered. 76% of these doses have been administered in only 10 countries. And 29% actually in one country in the United States have been administered because of the large <clears throat> population. At least nine different vaccines are being used, uh, being administered. And these are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. These are from well, the platform that is called the messenger RNA uh, so in the previous uh, presentations from uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, I think this was mentioned. Then there are the other vaccines are also the one from the Gamalaya from uh, Russia, Sinovac and Sinopharm from uh, the, uh, China. Then we have the Serum Institute of India that is manufacturing the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Oxford vaccine and also AstraZeneca pharmaceutical itself that is administering that. And then there's also Bharat Biotech that is um, manufacturing a, a one in India, the co-vaccine, and then of course the Johnson & Johnson that has uh, started. So by then campaigns have started by Friday, uh, uh, last week uh, campaigns had started in 144 countries. This included 70 high income countries, 40 upper middle income countries. And in the next slide, we'll go into details of who, which uh, countries these are, and 28 low and middle income countries and six low income countries. 79% of high income countries and all upper middle income countries that have started, uh, have started vaccinate, uh, vaccinating, while only 43% uh, for, uh, of low and middle income countries have started vaccinating as of uh, Friday uh, last week. So by then, by Friday last week, COVAX had shipped uh, doses to 37 countries, and this included 31 low and middle income countries. So there were five low, uh, lower middle income co countries, four uh, low income countries have started uh, their vaccination campaigns using uh, COVAX. And in total, by Friday last week, 29 million COVAX doses had been shipped to countries. <clears throat> Let's go again a bit into the details of where these vaccines have gone, uh, have, have gone to. So 144 uh, countries as of last uh, week, uh, end of last week had started uh, vaccinating. So there were 70, uh, 70 high income countries, 40 upper middle income countries, 28 lower middle income countries, six low income countries, giving a total of 144 uh, countries that had started. And let me, if you go to the, uh, to the right there of the, you will see uh, the names of all these countries where by Friday, la, last week they had started vaccinating. And I will just uh, concentrate on the ones that relate to COVAX and also the ones uh, for Africa. So if you look at the upper middle income countries that have started vaccinating by Friday last week, there was a, among them the, the upper middle income countries in Africa were Equatorial Guinea and uh, South Africa that have started vaccinating. Of the lower middle income countries that have started uh, vaccinating, there were various African countries there, including the ones that I've highlighted in yellow are the uh, African countries. So we have the Algeria, Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, and Zimbabwe. And among the low income countries there, we had the Gambia, Guinea, Rwanda, Togo, and Uganda. And the countries that are 
in yellow and in, uh, in uh, green are the countries that started uh, where the first uh, vaccinations started using, uh, where they, they started their vaccination using vaccines that came from COVAX. And this we are Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, and Ghana, which we said were the first to start on the 1st of March. There was also uh, Kenya, uh, Kenya, there was Nigeria, and then also the Gambia, Rwanda, Togo, and Uganda. So about eight countries uh, have started uh, vaccinations by Friday last week using uh, vaccines from the COVAX uh, facility. So if we look Again, the, this is just uh, the map of the world that shows uh, all the countries where vaccinations uh, have been given. And the darker the green color, the more vaccines that have been given. So we have the, the density, the total doses per 100,000 uh, population. We have the United States there that, the, and the, the UK, Israel, and all those ones, and Chile that are uh, in deep green, they, those are the ones where more than 20 uh, doses per 100 million population. And then the lighter ones are where vaccine, uh, the coverage is not yet very high. And then the ones that are just very clear, they are there. Most of them are in Africa, the countries that have not yet started uh, vaccinating. So you see a, a lot of uh, activities happening around the world in terms of vaccination, but in Africa, there's still uh, some work to be done. Some of the vaccines are coming from uh, COVAX. Some are coming from the African Union. Is eventually the 970 million doses they will start uh, coming there, and some of the countries would get, and even the ones that are vaccinating now might still get some vaccines from there. <clears throat> so, which countries are using which vaccines? This is just to show. So, they said 90, uh, 93 countries are using one vaccine, and 62 countries are using two or more. Uh, vaccines, 50, more than half of the countries are using the AstraZeneca, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, whether manufactured by AstraZeneca itself or the Serum Institute of India, or they have an agreement with the Serum Institute of India to manufacture that. And this, uh, they are shown here. So 83 countries are using the AstraZeneca vaccine. The 81 countries are using Pfizer. 32 countries are using the Moderna vaccine. 20 countries are using the Gamaleya vaccine from uh, Russia, the Sputnik V vaccine, then the 20 are using Sinopharm vaccines from uh, uh, China. And then for the, you can see they have put the names of the countries for the ones that, for the vaccines that are very few countries are using. So there's a Piva coronavirus, is another vaccine from uh, Russia. So only Russia is using that one. And then there is the Covaxin, that's uh, Bharat uh, from India. So only India is using that one. And then the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there are two countries using the United States of America and South Africa. And of course, the Sinovac vaccine, the 12 countries that are using that are listed there. So at the beginning, let's just say we had indicated that we had that the uh, COVAX has made supply agreements for 3.56 uh, billion doses. And these are agreements that were made some of before vaccines started, uh, while vaccines are still in trials, some of these vaccines are still uh, in, in trials, like the Sanofi GSK vaccine, but some of them already have been approved and they have started delivering. And we'll go just a bit into the details of this again. So in this uh, slide gives a bit, quite a lot of detail about the, uh, uh, the COVAX vaccine. So it is estimated that 2.265 billion doses uh, would have been uh, delivered by COVAX uh, this year. Some of those vaccines will go to, if you look on the right side there, it shows when those vaccines are expected. They started in February already, March, and these are the, the uh, that shows the, the doses, uh, million doses that are, that are being distributed per cumulative a month and the light green, the light blue, they are countries that are self financing, like South Africa, South Korea, that are also buying some vaccines through COVAX. But then the advanced market commitment countries are those ones where uh, vaccines are purchased through COVAX and given to them 
free. But what happens is they have to pr present a development and vaccine deployment plan showing how they are going to handle this vaccine, showing the regulatory uh, issues. How are they going to uh, have uh, what the mechanisms are in place in this countries to approve uh, and authorize the vaccines for use? The National Regulatory Authority. What uh, uh, what plans are in place to? for mobilizing the population, for prioritizing the populations to where, who will take this and how they are going to sequence this use uh, over time. What are the cool chain uh, requirements, the human resource uh, requirements, the monitoring of adverse events following immunization and all of that. They need to show that they have taught drug, all of that and the plans. And when, and there is a group that reviews these uh, plans. And once the, uh, and there might be questions you know, that need to be asked. And once uh, the uh, COVAX is satisfied, then Gavi releases the, this vaccine, the funding, and they go, the, these vaccines to go to these countries. And on the, on the right there, you are seeing on this slide, you uh, see the, the, when they are going to be released. But on the left there, it goes again into, for the, vaccines that are going to be released this year from, uh, there are legally binding uh, agreements that uh, uh, COVAX has already made. And those ones uh, you see there with the Astra, the 550 million doses from uh, uh, Astra, uh, Zeneca, and then the, there's an additional put through the ones manufactured by the Serum Institute of India and by AstraZeneca itself. So there are 520 million, uh, million doses there and 170 uh, million there. Then there is also the agreements with uh, Novavax, 550 million doses. This uh, vaccine that has not yet been authorized, but the clinical trials have shown that they will be safe uh, and effective. Then there's, there are 40 million doses from uh, Pfizer. So those are the the legally binding uh, agreements that have already been signed, but then the non-binding agreements, which are still being negotiated are with Johnson & Johnson, the Sanofi and GSK vaccines, they, those ones are the ones that are still in trial and might not uh, end up, we don't yet know what the outcome would be. And the notes that you see <clears throat> by the side, they just gives a bit of details in terms of contracts. Some of the supply uh, included in the projections are linked to deals that are already concluded those legally binding ones, and some are currently being negotiated. So the terms are subject to change. And in terms of uh, the candidate vaccines, some candidate vaccines are still in clinical development. If they do not achieve pos uh, positive clinical trial outcomes, that is, they are not found to be safe and effective, and they are not approved by regulatory authorities, then these volumes will not be procured by COVAX. So those are still the ones that are, don't yet know whether those vaccines would be, and if they're not, then maybe COVAX would buy those from the as supply becomes available from the ones that have been found to be safe and effective. And in terms of regulatory approval, the supply timing would depend on regulatory, uh, regulatory success and timelines, including review of individual batches. So before vaccines are released by COVAX to countries, there must be vaccines that have already been uh, Usually, most of these ones they start with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration by having emergency use authorization, the European Medicines Agency, but then WHO also. Then there is the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization at WHO that recommends these vaccines. And once they are recommended, these are vaccines also. WHO also has a regulatory process called the pre-qualification, where they look through the safety of the <clears throat> The vaccines and the efficacy, and then they also have an emergency use authorization, what they call emergency use listing. And it is only those ones that have been listed by WHO for emergency use that countries, uh, national regulatory authorities, those are the only ones that the COVAX and Gavi will purchase. And before they go to any country, the regulatory authority in that country must have approved them and licensed them for use either for emergency use authorization, or and most of these are still emergency use, not full license. And it's only when that has happened that the vaccines then arrive in those countries. And just notes about manufacturing. In many cases, manufacturing is yet to reach full scale. So manufacturing productivity will be influenced by multiple factors, which will in turn influence the volume and timing of the supply. And we've seen there have been a lot of criticism 
that COVAX has delayed in releasing these vaccines and some of that was linked to manufacturing and of course the scramble that we talked about in the, in, in the, in the, in the market. <clears throat> and we, we're going to end in the next five minutes. So some details about uh, COVAX again. So uh, the timing of uh, delivery will depend on various factors, including local regulatory approval in each country, country readiness. I talked about these plans that countries need to plan logistics and uh, uh, that are in place and in country distribution and also the indemnification and liability where con uh, to COVAX they have to be because some of the is some level of uh, the in uh, indemnification for in case there are issues with the uh, delivery of the vaccines and the administrations of the vaccines and the total potential supply is uh, this is around funding availability so the supply uh, total is, is, uh, uh, potential supply is showing procurement of those doses will depend on the COVAX advanced uh, market commitment uh, fundraising. So Gavi is still fundraising. They don't have all the funds to COVAX for all the those doses. There's the fundraising continues. It also depends on the cost sharing beyond the donor funded doses. Countries have to make some small contribution and the final prices and volumes of doses are located to the countries that are not uh, uh, self-financing. So this supply forecast reflect a preliminary distribution of doses based on each participant's share of available supply pro rata by demand and are to be treated as uh, indicative. Final timing and volumes will be determined by this an allocation uh, mechanism for this. And these are just some photos, the web of COVAX deliveries kicked off on the 24th of February. You can see on the left there, the first batch of COVAX vaccines arriving in Ghana, then on the 26th, they, were, they also arrived in South Korea. South Korea is a safe financing country, but they bought this through uh, COVAX, just like South Africa is also buying some vaccines through COVAX. 504 doses also arrived uh, on the 26th in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. On the 1st of March, Côte d'Ivoire and uh, Ghana started vaccinating, and you can see some of the first people who were vaccinated there. The, uh, and then the, on the 2nd of May, 3.9 million doses of the COVAX vaccines arrived in Nigeria. You see <clears throat> here on the 2nd of March, the, the COVAX doses vaccines arrived in Angola, in Cambodia, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and in, and in, in the Gambia. On the 3rd of March, the vaccine doses arrived in Rwanda, in Kenya, and Sudan. And you can see the celebration. And those ones, that, those ones, they are people, that, that, that some level of achievement that these vaccines are finally uh, arriving there. And on the 4th of March, they arrive in the Philippines. And more shipments are coming. All of this is available on the UNICEF uh, vaccine uh, market uh, dashboard. <clears throat> Just to see, show now where COVAX, uh, countries that have received uh, doses through COVAX, those are the countries that are indicated in yellow here. So the countries that are, uh, indicated in blue are the countries that have received their own vaccines through bilateral agreements. And you see various of them in Africa, including South Africa. And the ones that are in yellow are the ones, a lot of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Southeast Asia, and a, a few in uh, Latin America that have received uh, through COVAX. <clears throat> and the public uh, COVAX uh, rule out Dutch bosses, uh, these are the resources for that. You can see for the for for deliveries, you can see that link there from Gavi. You can see where they are being delivered. The that link there, you click there, you can have all the information about the deliveries. If you the, the second link, the UNICEF, these are the planned shipments and purchase uh, orders through that link. You can find all of that information from UNICEF. And the third link, there, number three, are for vaccinations. So from there, from WHO, you can see which countries have and vaccinating and in the next one minute uh, I will just finish by showing here that the just a summary for Africa of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. So the first uh, the A the map in A there so 10 countries introduced COVID-19 vaccines before COVAX vaccine delivery started on the 24th. These were the Seychelles, Mauritius, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Rwanda, South Africa, Equatorial Guinea, Zimbabwe, and Senegal. In the middle there, in B, 
you find COVAX deliveries in countries. So those are the countries that have already received uh, vaccines from uh, COVAX, uh, quite a lot of them. And on the right, there is just a total of countries that have started uh, vaccinating, whether the vaccines came through bilateral agreements or through uh, COVAX. And this is the, those are the, all the countries in Africa that were already vaccinating as of last uh, Friday. And in conclusion, <clears throat> So uh, this uh, uh, figure, left to die, is from a publication by the, the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Kenga Song, who is leading the African Union uh, process for procuring uh, vaccines. And he wrote this in October last year. Where, <clears throat> so, and I want to conclude by reminding us from the, what uh, Dr. Kenga Song recounts in this, that if you look at the Africa is indicated the, the brown color or uh, brown orange, there you see those are the, from 1990, you see how the number of people for, were, who were dying up, up to 2000 and around 2005 before antiretrovirals were widespread and you see the number of deaths reducing. But if you look at the uh, high income countries as shown by the United States, the drugs became available around 1995, and you see how deaths just plummeted and went down there. So in conclusion, let's remind ourselves that when antiretroviral drugs to treat HIV entered the market in the mid-1990s, the prices that companies set for these drugs put them out of reach. As deaths in rich countries plummeted, infected people were left to die across Africa. Between 1997 and 2007, about 12 million Africans died waiting for enough life-saving antiretroviral drugs to reach the continent. This could easily be a postscript to COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccination if adequate steps are not taken. So that is why uh, initiatives like COVAX, the African Union, and various national governments are working in their respective phase to head off that possibility of people being left to die in Africa while other vaccine nationalism is leading to vaccinations in other countries. Thank you so much. Over Thank to you, Tan. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. There's been a number of, of questions in the chat, so I'll hand over to Anal to uh, start taking you through those. Thank you very much, Charles. Yeah, at the moment, we've got one comment and 11 questions, but I'm going to pose them to you in batches of three, more or less. Okay. Um, Charles, I'm going to read it to you. And then just for your convenience, I'm going to post it in the chat as well. So if you need to refer to that um, visually as well. So the first question comes from Chidira from Darling FM in Nigeria, asking, will COVAX help low and middle income countries purchase vaccines at lower prices after the 20% doses. Then the second question comes from Boboker from Guinea, asking, um, or first stating that, uh, I know in some countries, COVAX was sending the AstraZeneca vaccine. I want to know if COVAX sent Astra AstraZeneca to everywhere in Africa. And now that AstraZeneca is being withdrawn from all over Europe, Will COVAX still provide this vaccine? Then we've just got a comment from Tadira uh, from Nigeria saying that the EMA just declared the AstraZeneca vaccine safe and effective this evening. Um, and then the fourth, uh, well, number four, but it's the third question. What is the African Union doing to help member states build capacity in storage infrastructure for vaccines? Um, I'm just going to post that to you in the chat. Um, yeah, I think that, that would be useful. So I th let's start with the, okay, that first uh, one from uh, Chidera about pro COVAX, will, will COVAX help uh, low and middle income countries purchase vaccines at lower prices after the 20% dose? That might be, I think that that is a, a possibility, but it depends also, just like we saw with what Gavi has done with the, uh, the previously for countries helping them to purchase vaccines after they graduate out of, uh, out of uh, Gavi. This is likely to be the scenario, but I think the priority now for COVAX is actually to be able to deliver 
on uh, for each country or at least uh, 20 percent of the population and once that is done i'm sure they are looking at the next step but the priority now is about delivering for the 3.5 billion doses that they think that would be able to uh, to for each country to at least vaccinate 20 percent of its population so and uh, for bubaka uh, well i know in some countries covax was sending the astrazeneca i want to know if COVAX uh, sent AstraZeneca to everywhere in Africa. Yes, all the vaccines that have been sent to from COVAX that there as a AstraZeneca vaccine is being withdrawn from other countries, will COVAX still provide? And I think the answer has been provided by, I think uh, Chidera from Nigeria just said there that the EMA just declared AstraZeneca vaccine safe and effective this evening. So it is important that those, you know, that is why, uh, just like in vaccination programs, the monitoring of adverse events following immunization is very important. And uh, adverse events following immunization, they are really uh, any event that happens uh, after the vaccination. And a lot of this would be coincidental. You know, there have been, as we saw there, the millions, hundreds of millions of doses has been uh, administered and just coincidentally, some things will happen during the time that vaccines have been given to people. But that, and that is why there needs to be careful, there needs to be uh, programs in each country to be able to investigate. So every case of any event that occurs around the time of vaccination, whether it is related to vaccination or not, it needs to be carefully investigated to find out if it is related to the vaccination. Some of it, it might be related, but it might not be the vaccine itself. It might be a lot of it are coincidental, but there might be things like we found with uh, uh, anaphylaxis where people can just uh, have this uh, anaphylactic shock where they need to be uh, admitted to hospital in a few cases to, to receive treatment. So some of those things could be re related to the vaccine. A lot of it will be coincidental. And some of it could be related to the process of administering the vaccine also. So those things need to be very much investigated. And now, and I was, that is why the European Medicine Agency, the EMA, they have, there have been investigations around these uh, blood clot claims and they have found out that it is not related to the vaccines and they say it is safe and effective. So. These vaccines will continue, but if there are in any country, if any country, like for example, South Africa, we are going to get vaccines through COVAX, but for South Africa, even before South Africa had indicated uh, that they, they were not going to be using AstraZeneca and even the ones that the South African government bought that they were uh, going to dispose of and either sending it to other countries or sending back to the manufacturer. So if in any country, if the regulatory authority has indicated that they are not going to receive any particular vaccine, the COVAX will not be sending that vaccine to that country. But the evidence shows that the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe, like the uh, European uh, uh, Medicine Agency has said. Many countries in Europe are still using the UK. For example, that's the main vaccine that is being used in the, in the UK. They are also using Pfizer and the other vaccines. So, and it is good to continue monitoring this Anything that happens needs to be reported. Even one other thing, apart from adverse events following immunization, there is something that uh, the, uh, that is referred to in terms of monitoring also called the adverse events of uh, special interest. So even if for people who have not taken the vaccines, during this time that we are giving vaccines, if something happens uh, somewhere that is unusual or something, it is good to also investigate, even if this has not happened, and people who have taken vaccines. So they use this to really strengthen systems to be able to investigate and find out if there are any safety concerns. And then from EFI saying that, that what is the AU doing to help member states build capacity and storage infrastructure for vaccines? I think the African uh, Union and countries even to themselves, like through Gavi, a lot of countries already have the storage facilities have been built. The, the African Union is going to be procuring some of the Pfizer vaccines and does need ultra storage. So really before they get released to countries, they need to be uh, confident that the countries are going to use that. And I'm sure between the national governments, the African Union and other uh, uh, 
people, the World Health Organization and UNICEF, they, uh, they are working together to be able to build capacity of countries, the storage and ensure that these vaccines are kept. Uh, they remain, they remain uh, high quality, they are not spoiled and for that, they need to be stored in the re required uh, storage uh, temperatures. They have they to have adequate storage facilities. So yes, the African Union is working with uh, countries around that. But beyond that, also national governments and other agencies are working with governments to ensure that that happens. Thank you, Prof. Um, the next, next question comes from Bennett from Nigeria asking, why is it not possible for African countries to be administered all brands of the COVID vaccines to douse talks of inequity? Johnson & Johnson, for example, is unavailable in most of Africa. Secondly, from Victor, um, with a delay of accessing vaccines, won't this lead to so-called pandemic fatigue? With the above challenge, won't people end up discouraged to inoculate? And then the third question, Victor is also asking, how is the AstraZeneca's problem being addressed where it has shown blood clotting in some other countries? Um, I think the comment from Shadira just a bit earlier maybe relates to that, but um, I'm gonna pose these, these questions to you in the, in the chat, um, Prof. Um, okay. There you go, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Anel, and thank you to the colleagues for those uh, questions. So for Bennett, what is, uh, why is it not possible for African countries to be administered all brands of the COVID-19 vaccines to those talks of inequity? Johnson & Johnson, for example, is unavailable in most, uh, Afri in most of Africa. Yes, just talking about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, if you, uh, if you saw one of the slides that indicated, the only two countries that are using the Johnson & Johnson vaccines are the United States of America and South Africa. And, and even in South Africa, it is still being used, though it is, uh, they're trying to see the, uh, what is called an implementation trial because it has not yet been uh, authorized by our national regulatory authority for, it has only been authorized to be used in the context of, so they're ruling out in the context of a, a, a research uh, project, not yet, uh, roll out as a public health program. So it has not yet, and it has, and also in most African countries, they have not yet uh, received that uh, regulatory approval. We know that the, in the US, they already had that authorization and in, in, in Europe to the EMA has given that. So these are the, like the vaccines that countries can also do. You saw from the African Union there, they are securing some doses from some supplies from the Johnson and Johnson. And, and remember that the these doses, the companies, everybody is going to this uh, to this uh, companies to buy. So they, and they have made some commitments to already supply agreements with countries long before the, their trials uh, uh, stop because people already made that risk of engaging. So if your vaccine becomes safe and effective, we are going to buy. So it is in terms of all those constraints that the vaccines that are being delivered uh, earlier, the first ones now, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson will come. For some countries, they will also receive Pfizer, but for Pfizer vaccines, really, they are, you know, they need to be stored at these ultra cold temperatures, which many places in Africa will not afford. And that is not really the vaccine for, for Africa. Johnson & Johnson, single shot, no, the normal fridge temperature, that would really be the ideal for African countries. You don't need to, AstraZeneca also within the, uh, since various, uh, like the European Medicines Agency has reviewed and says that it continue, that is safe and effective for use. So it's, it can be stored at the, no, uh, the temperature, uh, your normal fridge uh, temperature, so in the normal fridge. So those are the vaccines that will really be uh, of great use and widespread use in, in, in Africa. And the, uh, Victor asked, with the delay of addressing vaccines, delay of assessing vaccines, wouldn't this lead to pandemic fatigue? With the above challenge, would people end up discouraged to inoculate? I, uh, Definitely agree. People have been waiting for uh, the, uh, these vaccines and we've generated a demand. We know that there is hesitancy, but there's 
Uh, also, a large majority of people want the vaccines, but the vaccines are not available. But they are being delivered within the constraints that we've seen, the delivery constraints, manufacturing constraints, and also regulatory constraints that are still in place. And I think it, people would be, well, they have a right to uh, justifiably uh, fatigue, pandemic fatigue, but I think journalists, uh, us all, we need to really continue when the vaccines are available, really con encourage people to take it. That's the best we can. Everybody's going, there has never been a time on earth where everybody's going after one community like these vaccines. And we are even lucky that for once, for once there are many vaccines that are available for one particular disease, but th this is not still enough. So uh, we just need to keep the momentum, uh, all of us, journalists especially, spreading the information when the vaccines become available. And if the vaccines are not yet available, really get the information, just let people know, probably if the information is already clear when they will arrive. So people know when uh, they will come and probably not expecting that it will be there tomorrow when it might only come in one month. So when we get the right information from the governments that are procuring the vaccine, when it be, will be available, which people will be prioritized when it comes and when it will be available, we should really be spreading that information just to let people know. And in the meantime, that people should continue the non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, interventions, your masking, uh, physical distancing, avoiding large cloud, crowds and, and uh, washing hands. So let's see, uh, Victor, how is the AstraZeneca problem being addressed where it has been shown uh, blood clotting in some countries? Uh, I think this was the European Medicine Agency, they have looked at the data again, they say it is not uh, related. In the UK, they continue using it. They have also are saying that it is uh, safe and effective that the blood clots are not related, but it is important that this continues to be that countries that are, are using it, that they continue monitoring adverse events following immunization really is very important. Monitoring people who have taken the vaccines, following them up, and if there is uh, there are any issues that they are dealt with. So thank you, Anil, and thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, next question also is from Victor. He's asking, how can Africa receive dependable vaccines due to limited resources they have? Then Shadiria asks, um, do African countries have a percentage they pay to Gavi for these vaccines? Or does Gavi function with the money um, from donors? Then the third question in this batch comes from Marcia Zali asking, um, Seeing that rich countries purchase the bulk of vaccines and with most African countries facing financial constraints, would you say that our targets are realistic in the race to vaccinate as, as many people as possible? Um, okay. There you go. Okay, let me start with, yeah, Victor, you are busy today. Huh? <laughs> this is just a joke. Yeah, thank you for the questions, Victor. How can Africa receive dependable vaccines due to the limited resources they have? Well, that is a good question. I am sure we can, we've seen all the efforts that are being made either through, the, you know, some of the countries that introduced the, the they made the, their own arrangements with, the, for example, Russia to deliver the vaccines with, uh, chi with China and some uh, through COVAX, some through the African Union. So. I think people are when there is a will, there's always a way. Uh, if the gov if the the government's really plan, because other things they do find resources for other things, I'm sure they can plan. This is a very good investment and to use all the resources that are available. So your answer is as good as mine, Victor. That's what I can say around that. And then uh, Chidera, do African countries have a percentage they pay to Gavi for? vaccines or doses for money from donors. It really depends the low income, very low income countries, they get the vaccines, uh, they, are, they are paid free. There is from the, from the donors. But of course, other African countries like South Africa and the rest, they pay for their own vaccines, even though they receive them through uh, uh, COVAX. But of course, even when the vaccines come 
uh, free, there are still things that countries need to do. For example, the administration of the vaccines is still, uh, they still need to pay for those uh, logistics, the, the, the cold chain, the administration, and all the other things that come with administering the vaccine. So those are not, they, they also, there's a cost to that. So even when vaccines are coming free, they still need, or right, that's why each country needs to have what they call the national deployment and vaccination uh, plan that spells out. The, the, there are guidelines from WHO, from COVAX, uh, uh, Gavi on uh, how to prepare those uh, the plans and what they need to think through. So even when the vaccines come free, there are still a lot of costs that they need to think through and, and, and prepare. So uh, Marcia, seeing that uh, rich countries purchase a bulk of vaccines and with most African countries facing financial constraints, would you say that our targets are realistic in the rest to vaccinate as many uh, people as possible? Well, it's good to be ambitious. And that is why with some countries in South Africa, for example, uh, the country, uh, the government is, the plan is to vaccinate about 67% of the population, the adult uh, population. In various countries, the, the vaccines that they can receive from at least the current uh, COVAX, what one might call COVAX 1.0, there might be a COVAX 2.0. COVAX 3.0, as though when we finish with one target of 20%, there might be other arrangements to get the other ones. So, so the, with COVAX, the plan is that the vaccines that are coming is to vaccinate 20% of the population. Vaccinating 20% of the population of a country is not, uh, is, is not a joke. It, it's a lot. To, it, there's a lot of, even if the vaccines are coming free, to be able to do that. But Africa has done that before. We've had for... Uh, many countries in Africa have uh, planned mass vaccination campaigns for measles up to about 15, for people up to 15 years, which are large populations. The countries in the meningitis belts, so they've had experience of uh, organizing mass vaccination campaigns there for meningitis that vaccinate a whole range of the population. So yeah, I think it is it's good to be ambitious, but of course plan to be able to reach that ambition, ensure that it becomes uh, realistic. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, I have still three questions here, and I think we will have time for three more questions. So if there are journalists on the call who have some more burning questions, um, I think we'll be able to take three more ones if you want to post that in the meantime. Um, OK, Charles, the first one also comes from Effie asking what are you doing to encourage some of the African countries, for example, Tanzania, that are still reluctant to administer vaccines to their people? Second question also from Effie. Um, in future, what plans are there to help build the capacity within the Africa continent to manufacture uh, vaccines? And then lastly from Esther, do you think if Tanzania applies for vaccines now, it will be too late? Okay, let's see the questions. Yeah, very challenging questions there. So now let's start with Effie. What are the what are you doing to encourage some of the African countries, for example, Tanzania, that are still reluctant to administer vaccines to their people? Well. You know, the information that I have now showed, there are various, uh, through the African uh, Union, they have representations at the African Union, at the World Health Organization. They also receive other vaccines apart from uh, uh, COVID vaccines, from COVID-19 uh, vaccines from Gavi. I, I'm sure that through those, I don't have the details, but I think that through those initiatives, there are, I'm sure various uh, people engage uh, and, by, and even in bilateral talks probably with other entities like the European Union and others, I'm sure there's some level of engagement at that time. But of course, no country, just like uh, COVID-19 vaccines, even when they are available in the country, they are not compulsory, they are not mandatory. At least for most countries, they are not mandatory. I don't know if of any African country that is planning to make them mandatory. Also, countries also have a right. They, this is there's, there's some level of country ownership. 
like we, we, we said before, when the vaccines are provided even free, the country still needs to plan to be able to administer these vaccines. To be able to, there are still a lot of costs. So this cannot be forced on any country. It will have to be, those can only be advice that can be given to the country, but there's a, a country ownership. It has to come from the country. The country has to order the vaccines and supply uh, the, the uh, a request with their national development and vaccination plan showing how they are going to use the vaccines before they can get them and no other country will be able to go in there and vaccinate uh, its people. It will have to be that country. So <clears throat> Esther, do you think if Tanzania applies for vaccines now, it will not be too late? Well, it's never too late. When they apply now, there are other countries that are already in line, but since the plan was through COVAX that all countries would get their share, I'm sure Tanzania, if they apply, they will still uh, they will have to get at least for the 20% uh, of, of, of their population. But they need to apply. This, this cannot be forced on any uh, on any country. In, so, and let's see the other question to help then uh, in future. What plans are there to help build capacity within African countries to manufacture vaccines? I think that is a very important question. There have been some African countries that have manufactured vaccines in the past, but that have not manufactured again. South Africa used to manufacture vaccines, but now they haven't, but they do have, we have the BioVac Institute. There's also Aspen, uh, they are able to, where Johnson & Johnson is planning to, to manufacture some of the vaccines in, in South Africa, in Senegal, Senegal manufactures the yellow fever vaccine. And there are also, there are some countries where maybe that believe that they can also manufacture vaccines. I think uh, Nigeria has plans. I think Egypt and Ethiopia, they do indicate that they can manufacture vaccines. Even before COVID-19 vaccine, there was something called the African Vaccine Manufacturing uh, 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 Initiative, uh, Manufacturers Initiative where there have been initiatives in, uh, at various levels to ensure that uh, countries can manufacture vaccines. And I think COVID-19 has shown us that it's really, countries really need to think, take that very seriously. There's no reason why South Africa shouldn't be manufacturing vaccines with the infrastructure they have. In Senegal, they are manufacturing the yellow fever vaccines, I'm sure with uh, some uh, adjustments, they could also be manufact manufacture uh, COVID-19 vaccines or other vaccines. And Nigeria had a plan for that. Other countries also have a plan. I know Ethiopia, Egypt, and the others. So definitely, this is really important. And this is something that needs to be pushed from all levels. Generalists, I would also encourage that in every country, these are things to bring up at various uh, political discussions and also for advocacy to ensuring that we, we, the countries should really be able to manufacture their own vaccines. And Esther, do you think if Tanzania applies for vaccines, that would be too late? I think we, we talked about, we looked at that uh, already. So thank you, uh, Anil. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles. Um, we've mm -hmm. got one further question at the moment from Dr. Governor <laughs> asking, how was it decided in what order to distribute the COVAX doses? From what I know, uh, and obviously I don't, uh, is there are, I I've been part of the review of proposals that countries, the national development and uh, vaccination plans that I talked about that countries have uh, applied to COVAX to get the vaccine. So when countries apply, there are some of the, when they have, if their plans are already satisfactory, then the vaccines, does, then the vaccines can then be programmed. To be to be uh, delivered, but the, some of us, uh, most of the times when countries submit these plans, there are still some questions or some of the things that have not been addressed adequately. Issues, for example, there are some countries that do not clearly state how they are going to talk about regulatory approval of these vaccines. For some countries, what they do is they will already have some level of recognition. Like for example, there are some countries that would say, if a stringent regulatory authority like the US Food and Drug Administration or the, uh, the South African uh, Health Products Regulatory Authority has approved the vaccine, and it is a vaccine that uh, has been, uh, that has received emergency use listing approved by WHO, they would recognize that and will not need to do the testing of the vaccine within their countries. But 
there are others that might need to test in order to uh, the vaccine batches before they can authorize. And so when they put these um, uh, plans to COVAX, some all these things need to be, and there are various things, it's regulatory, it's also about communication, risk communication, the, it's about uh, the, the human resources to be able to administer the vaccine, is the monitoring of adverse events following immunization. And they need to tick all these boxes to show that what the plans they have in place, unless these are well uh, specified and they're satisfactory, they, their plans will not be approved. And then if they are not approved, then uh, COVAX doesn't release uh, uh, the doses. So th that is probably, uh, one can say that is the main reason why some countries are, are already getting vaccines and some have not yet received the vaccines. Thank you very much. Um, I think, let me just see, was there any further? Yeah. So two more questions. Um, one from Effie. Do you think the national regulatory institutions have the capacity to test the vaccines? And then from Dr. Govender again. So was South Africa late in meeting COVAX requirements as had been reported? So we'll make these the, the, the final two questions. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, uh, Anil. So from Effie, do, do I think that the national regulatory authorities have the capacity to test vaccines. Yeah. Some vaccines, uh, uh, some uh, countries have the capacity, but maybe others don't have. So countries are at different, uh, different levels, but if they are not able to test, they need to have a mechanism in place that if they have been tested in this particular country and they have confidence in the regulation of that country, maybe they would not need to test them or they have been approved, but they need to be able to show that they have thought through that and they have a mechanism in place that even if they are not able to test, they will depend on the testing that has been done maybe in South Africa or uh, another country that has a stringent regulatory authority. And it might be that not every country has the capacity to test, but they need to think through all of that. And has uh, South Africa, was South Africa led in submitting? Well, I, I, I'm not aware of uh, about the, uh, the details of South Africa's uh, uh, submissions, the one I've been part of the, the reviews and I only review the ones that have been assigned to me. So I've not, uh, I don't know when South Africa, I don't know the details around South Africa's submission. Thank you, Charles. Um, I just want to uh, um, show you that there was just a last comment from Bennett, not, not really a question, just a comment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, so that now, okay, so he says, uh, you are correct about Africa producing vaccines, but nobody is certain it will get regulatory approval. Well, it depends on what you mean by regulatory. The regulatory approval is not only, if you are producing for, I'm, I'm not sure whether you are talking about regulatory approval by the US FDA or EMA, uh, uh, or, or are you talking about, because each country has its own regulatory uh, system. We have the yellow fever vaccine that is produced in uh, in Dakar in Senegal. It is used all over the all over the world. So it would get regulatory approval because there are there are uh, boxes that need to be ticked. They need to inspect the facilities. Some of the uh, regulatory authorities before approved, they need to see how it has been manufactured, the facilities, the process of manufacturing there. And when these are submitted to the there's a these are voluminous uh, dossiers, and some of the ones that are submitted to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, for example, you can see some of them are available online, and those are the kind of documents that regulatory authorities require, and if those are satisfied, then they will definitely be able to uh, receive approval. So I don't think that just because they're manufactured in Africa that they will not be approved, but it will have to be how they are manufactured, and the process is to ensure that these are high-quality vaccines, just like yellow fever vaccine that is being manufactured in Senegal and it is used everywhere. Thank you, Prof. Waisonge. That brings us to the end of the Q&A session. And thank you very much for your presentation as well. Um, Professor Young, I'll hold, hand over to you now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for the 
the questions that you pose. Thank you, Charles, for your presentation. Um, just before I hand over to Mia uh, for, uh, for our uh, closing uh, input, um, it will be really great to take a photo, a group photo of everyone. So this is now where I'm going to ask you to please switch your video on and then we will do a group photo. Great to see you all after two weeks. <laughs> oh God, some of us are in darkness. Let me stand here. That's excellent. Uh, okay. We, that's great. People are coming on. I only see half the screen. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. That's great. We Waiting for a few more people. Okay, that's excellent. Lovely to, to see all of you. Uh, it, okay. So, Mia, I hand over to you. Are uh, you on mute? Do you want to take a picture first, um, Taryn? Yes, okay. yes, let's do I'm, I'm going to. Okay. There we go. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending this course and for being so patient and for asking such great questions in each session. Um, I was really surprised about all the questions at each session and it made me quite, quite excited that, that people had so many questions. I really hope it will help you somewhat in your reporting on vaccine rollouts in your countries over the next few months as the vaccines become available. And at Bikisisa, we will be creating a website that will include all the YouTube videos and the PowerPoint presentations of each session. So if you wanted to access the entire course in one place, or if you wanted to refer someone to it, we'll send out the website address to you when it's ready in about two weeks. But we also need your help. Um, we need to know what we did well and what we could have done better so that we can design future courses based on your feedback. So we'll be sending out an evaluation questionnaire to all of you tomorrow. It will really take five minutes to complete or less than five minutes. And we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to fill it out. And in the same mail, we will also have a course questionnaire. It's the same questionnaire that you received at the beginning of the course. And we just wanna figure out if this course has helped you to get a better score. Um, we're not interested in you individually as much, you know, so don't, don't worry about what you get. We are interested in the average and to see, you know, if there was a general change. And lastly, I would like to thank Darren Young. As you know, she's from the Center for Evidence. What do you need? Sorry. Okay. And um, she's been a really great chair and she's also really designed the curriculum of this course and she identified the speakers. So Darren, thank you very much for putting in the time and the effort all voluntarily um, for this. We really appreciate it as journalists. And Anel, thank you for your great moderation of all the questions. And I'd also like to thank the Big Asisa team, Rosalind Daniel and Hoblang Mahao, for handling all the logistics of this course, from advertising it to designing the questionnaires and setting out all the communication and liaising with speakers often. And that's it from me, Mia at Big Asisa. I hope you have a good evening. Stay safe, wear a mask, and get vaccinated when those vaccines become available in your country. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.
Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Nice Thank evening you. from Kenya.